Uh, thanks, Marlia, for this warm introduction. Uh, and I would like, on my behalf, to thank you uh, for hosting me here. It was a, a very interesting experience, a very useful experience. And uh, with your guidance and uh, your style of management, I totally enjoyed that. And uh, I know how to compare different management styles of working in different countries. And I totally appreciate that. Thank you for, thank you for that. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about labor migrant households in Uzbekistan. Uh, this uh, paper, policy paper, is based on the uh, GIZ, GIZ surveys in uh, conducted. Scott, welcome. GIZ surveys conducted in uh, Uzbekistan in 2013-2014, and um, the idea was to um, see the pattern of uh, remittances and uh, to see spending patterns and to see a connection of remittances and poverty for this project. And I went personally to, to the field to, to collect uh, information, to do random checks, to, 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 to make quality controls uh, happen. And uh, this was a very interesting experience for myself coming from Tashkent, being a capital boy, uh, coming to the region and see that basically the reality is completely different from, from what I see in the capital city. And uh, it struck me and I decided to proceed and to understand what is actually the driving force for uh, current spending pattern of remittances, and that's why I decided to engage into this topic. Uh, just to give you, oops, no, yes. So uh, it's, this is the number. Eighty percent of people with whom we talked said that they would like to open up their business. So the final the idea is to go to mostly to Russia to earn enough money to open up their own small business and then to come back. And it was a striking number, eighty percent. So we really wanted to see how actually these plans develop. Do they actually materialize? And then we just realized that actual expenses are quite different. If you see the traditional rights, and mostly they, so these are weddings, uh, they make up 18%, education make 10%, and then you have like list of consumption items, but if you go to debt, I don't know whether you can see it from there, it's like 4% of all spendings. And this debt also mostly belongs to, to the category of traditional rights. Uh, because people do borrow when they arrange weddings, when they arrange cultural ceremonies, and uh, this is how they accumulate debts. And uh, savings constitute only 3%. So, you see, in reality, it didn't really match to the extent uh, that a labor migration initially was expecting were before, before going to Russia. And uh, this was uh, a very striking number, and I, I realized that uh, there should be something behind apart from uh, social cultural factors that influence this kind of uh, pattern of spending. And uh, also, um, I, 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 I actually deliberately uh, distinguished between productive and unproductive spending, and I would like to apologize in front of anthropologists here because my uh, definition of productive goes to uh, economic issues. So basically productive when it makes up, when it creates further value for the household, when it creates further source of income for the household. Uh, because from anthropological view, definition could be slightly different, saying that anyway, so for example, if they're having wedding and spending on wedding, then the uh, network is expanding, they're getting like more people in, the, in, in their household or in their network, and uh, it, it's productive anyway. So I actually do not focus on that, I focus purely on the economic point of view because I would like to link that to opening up the business to, to this 80% which you actually saw. And uh, that's why my, my major research question is, what are the major uh, issues that prevent um, labor migrants or households uh, to open up their business uh, besides, besides, uh, besides, of course, social cultural uh, factors and besides societal pressure? Um, here's the methodology. So we conducted 15. Uh, we talked to 1,500 households, uh, all in all 8,622 individuals. Uh, we conducted 16 focus group discussions, once, uh, one in every region of Uzbekistan and uh, two with experts. Uh, we, we talked both with households with and without labor migrants. We did random quality control procedures because uh, we really cared about the quality of the data, so we're, we're going to the field and checking whether all the procedures are observed because the, the, the uh, the questionnaire itself was quite lengthy, and um, so we, we, we tried to make sure that uh, all, all, the, all the necessary procedures are observed. 
And uh, the major limitation of this study, especially I have to mention this in DC at this period of time, that it doesn't account uh, for the Russian crisis because these surveys were uh, conducted in 2013-2014. Um, so household survey coverage, uh, if you, it's, it's actually an interesting pattern, but uh, understandable at the same time that uh, there are less labor migrants around Tashkin, the capital, around Tashkin region, uh, because they, they, they do have some connections with Tashkin, or they do have some business with Tashkin, uh, where all the money actually based. And uh, once you go out of Tashkin, then you actually see that uh, the pattern is slightly different, because in Samarkand, in Kashkadaria region, so it's basically south of Uzbekistan, uh, then situation is, is, is much different because labor migrants, uh, there are lots of labor migrants uh, coming from, from these areas. Um, one, one exception from this case is in our region in the, in the north, uh, the biggest one yellow you can see. So um, it, doesn't have, it doesn't account for many labor migrants in our sample and uh, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what is the major reason for that. And uh, one of the reasons I, I attribute to um, the creation of uh, Nawai Industrial Zone, where people actually uh, could find some uh, work placement. So here we go to uh, see the financial situation of households. This is a subjective assessment of current financial situation of, of households. And you can see that the majority can pay for basic necessities, but not for appliances. And uh, only 1% can get a new house or a car or an apartment. That's a striking number because if you see uh, the cost for, for wedding, then uh, basically it's, it, it falls into this category. So you should, you should can, it's like I can, add, can get a new house or car or a ready wedding, it's the same thing. But only 1% can do it, but at the same time the, the, the scale of that is so huge. So 4% cannot, it's actually 3.7, cannot cover basic food expenses. And still they, they actually fall into this trap and at the same time as, as uh, we realized not the poorest live, uh, live Uzbekistan uh, for labor migration to, to, to seek for employment uh, outside the country. And uh, here is the price of the wedding uh, in Uzbekistan, it's $10,000 on average and uh, this is a huge number. And uh, at the same time you can see that the demand for weddings and uh, uh, actually, the sophistication with all this number of ceremonies and traditions uh, actually ex go beyond any economic rationale. And this is also uh, something which puzzles uh, any person who comes with a strict economic point of view, you know. So it's very hard to come like work from strict economic point of view and explain this kind of rationale. Uh, here I, I actually compared wedding costs in um, uh, in different countries, and Scott, as you can see, I reshuffled the table, and um, actually, I, I actually put initially two uh, countries from uh, South Asia, Bangladesh and Nepal, because they are also labor migrant dependent countries, remittance dependent countries. I added two other Central Asian countries as Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, which are also remittance dependent countries, and Tajikistan goes number first in terms of accumulating remittances in the world. And then I have two developed countries, UK and USA, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and you can see the difference here, sorry. Uh, you can see that the difference here is that uh, the Uzbek case is not that dreadful if we compare it to Bangladesh and Nepal. So it takes 23 years for, for, for Nepalese or 14.2 years for Bangladeshi to uh, earn enough money to arrange a wedding, which is a crazy number. And then you go to USA and you can see there is a huge, huge discrepancy, right? And uh, Uzbekistan is just 2.26 years, which, are which is manageable, but at the same time, it's, a, it's also this number uh, says a lot that basically uh, households should mostly focus on their uh, accumulation of their funds uh, without actually spending on other items in order to arrange a wedding. And actually taking into account that in households they have three, four, five children, then basically you can count yourself that you can dedicate your entire life to actually to arrange weddings. And uh, so uh, for, it's, it's actually interesting that uh, in, in, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, wedding costs are higher than in Uzbekistan. That's, that's, that's an interesting observation taking into account that the salaries are low in, in, in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, oops. So uh, here are the major f findings. 
So we, we did not find any differences between households with and without labor migrants. So basically they spent, they spent uh, the same amount of money for weddings and cultural ceremonies. So, and this can also explain the rationale for going abroad. So basically if you don't have enough money, so you go abroad to earn this money to arrange a wedding. Another thing is occupational shift from agriculture to construction for obvious reasons, because uh, labor migrants mostly come from rural areas and they go abroad and uh, mostly engage into construction works, then they come back, and uh, uh, that's a, that can be a very interesting follow-up study to find out how this uh, occupational change pattern influences the economy. So whether they uh, come and, and apply these skills, or whether they lose these skills and come back to agriculture or do something else, that's a very interesting question. So remittance spending is unproductive. Again, uh, apologies uh, to anthropologists here. And then, uh, so, then I was asking myself, okay, but these are traditions and usually they die hard. So can, can we actually do something to change this pattern, to, to break this vicious circle? And uh, when, when talking to labor migrants and in, in fo during focus groups, we realized that people do complain about the current system, about the number of ceremonies, about the uh, cost of, of waiting. But at the same time, they keep doing that because the societal pressure is there. They say, and, and we actually asked during focus group discussions, imagine that your uh, neighbors will, will do less, uh, like less lavish weddings. Will you follow that pattern? They say, yes, absolutely. You know, that, this is a very, very interesting thing because these weddings, uh, it's, it's like a signal to the community you belong to that you are doing well. And that's why you are actually doing this over and over again. And uh, since, Actually, the, the desire is there to change this pattern or break this vicious circle. I thought it would be actually, it is, it, it is possible to, uh, to change this pattern, but then we have to identify what are the issues that prevent them from, from arranging these kind of weddings and spending so much money on weddings instead of investing to, uh, to some businesses. So here are the issues, and uh, this picture is not taken in Uzbekistan. Um, and uh, you can see that poor donkey cannot handle that. And this is exactly the same thing what, what happens in, in many households in Uzbekistan because these weddings uh, come very expensive and uh, many, many, many people try to uh, uh, actually live with this load, heavy load their life and, then, and it doesn't help them to uh, move anywhere actually. So they are sore somewhere in the air. So this is the issue uh, which many households experience. So, we basically identified that uh, there are four major issues and one overarching issue. Four major issues. The first one is unfavorable financial infrastructure, that banks do not go to rural areas, do not provide some kind of packages for labor migrants, and uh, this uh, results in, uh, in general mistrust uh, or lack of credibility towards banks from, from labor migrants or from households in rural areas, and also lack of knowledge and awareness so People are not aware of uh, how to get loan, basic things basically. How to get loan, how to arrange a business, how to start, what to do, nothing. They usually follow the pattern of their neighbor. So for example, if their neighbor is successful in doing something, they say, oh, he, he's, he is successfully implementing this, opening up this shop, I have to follow his few steps. So, and uh, the, another issue is, uh, and it's a big issue, weak law enforcement, to be fair, we have to say that the government already initiated the, uh, the the number of uh, guests at the wedding should be no more than 250 people, but it's not always enforced. So once you have money and you can pay for that, then basically you can have uh, a wedding of, with 500, 800 people even sometimes. And uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is one of the major issues as well. And this overarching issue is sense of capitalism, that, a sense of, sorry, fatalism, that nothing can be changed actually. So uh, we, we, um, our, our grandfathers did, did this, our fathers did this, so why we should actually, how we can actually break this pattern? So it's been, it's been there for such a long time. And uh, it's better to accept this, yes, uh, it would be nice to spend this money somewhere else, but the society is there, members of households require that, yes, let's spend it within one day for a luxury wedding. Um, and here, like the policy recommendations, I actually divided them into two, into uh, short-term and long-term. Short-term, which can be uh, relatively easily achieved, and uh, long-term, which require more attention from the government. The first one is banks uh, should go uh, to rural areas and provide some packages to, to uh, labor migrants. 
and uh, since they are barely represented there, and if you don't have a, 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 like any bank nearby, so if you have to go to a bank, for example, and it takes like one, two hours to get to a bank, but it, it, this, this, this actually situation does not create, uh, does not create any kind of encouraging uh, factors. And at the same time, Chamber of Commerce, which is quite active in Tashkent, in, in, in uh, cities in, in Uzbekistan, it's not active in rural areas. So people should be uh, schooled in a way that uh, get education on how to do basic things, how to get a loan, how to start their own business, how to write a business plan. And uh, this kind of thing is, is highly missing. Um, as a long run thing, I was thinking about introduction of basic financial education at schools. It's something like, I don't know if some of you are familiar with the German loan Taschengeld, so basically pocket money that uh, everyone has to, like even being a child, has to manage his own, his own budget. And this is how you start actually managing your budget from since childhood and then you develop that and you develop this understanding and then you become much more rational than, than as, as it is now in Uzbekistan. And then another thing, which is a big project, I was thinking about the identification of a pilot region in Uzbekistan, and uh, I was thinking that Kashkadarya is a perfect case for that in, in the south of Uzbekistan, uh, that uh, less, uh, they're less traditional compared to Fergana Valley, but at the same time, if uh, there, there could be some bank loan, some uh, better business environment, and then uh, to actually show some success cases on TV, and uh, people watch TV like crazy, and to send them a message basically that instead of spending this money, and really you can you can be better off by opening up your your own business and uh, look at these successful entrepreneurs. This might work, but of course that's a very uh, difficult undertaking, and it might require lots of resources and uh, uh, attention. So having said this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and if you have any of these, please let me know. Thank you. So uh, Farof looks at the survey of 1,500 households in Uzbekistan, almost more than almost 9,600 individuals, uh, and asks uh, interesting questions on uh, how remittances are spent in families that have migrants versus those that don't have. Uh, are they spent uh, on uh, lavish expenses, wedding expenses, and? Uh, how uh, the, what are the policies to channel the remittances into more productive and growth enhancing activities. Uh, he presents uh, interesting results on that 18% are on, rich, uh, on traditional uh, expenses uh, besides food and other consumption expenses. So there is a whole debate in literature that uh, are remittances good for economic growth or not? Uh, Economists, it's inconclusive. Some papers argue that it's uh, good for growth. Some argue no, it's not good for growth. Uh, but the issue is that it, if it is channeled to investments, it promotes growth. If it is consumption, not. And uh, aggregate data has not been uh, successful in answering these questions. And there is always need for micro-level studies, household studies, to uh, look at these questions in detail and. This survey could be one of those. Uh, what, uh, well, some, uh, some of my questions, uh, the, like Farrell has already answered, I read the paper and have a list of comments, suggestions, and questions for him. Uh, the, uh, what I see are uh, a set of nice questions, good survey, and policy recommendations, but uh, maybe little work on the con making a coherent story. Like, Connecting the questions uh, to the survey and the policy recommendation. So the, what I see, the data has gives some facts that do not answer the questions directly. But for example, 
one of the questions is uh, how expenditure pattern differs <coughs> across families with and without migrants. So the topic is uh, are remittances blessing or not blessing? And the finding is that, well, the pattern in the remittance recip recipients doesn't differ with the remittance, but with those that do not receive remittances. And if that's the case, then how do we answer? Are remittances then blessing or not? Uh, families, why don't they spend more or less? And if migrants, 80% of them go outside of the country to open up businesses, maybe they succeed. Maybe all <coughs> succeed and send remittances home, but remittances are, well, average savings rate in countries are, in developing countries are a little bit more than 20%. Maybe they send that uh, amount of saving home, but uh, in the destination country also open up their business. Mm -hmm. So, and, uh, what there is also another important question in the paper like you throw a lot of interesting questions that uh, maybe the I mean, the data is uh, it's very rich but you know, more to answer these questions like what influences false, false hope decisions in making use of remittances and uh, uh, what are the uh, what are the policies that channel can channel remittances to uh, investment so uh, what I uh, what what I like to know about the data is one uh, differentiation between immigrants and Im immigrants. So immigrants are those that are inside uh, Uzbekistan from other countries. And immigrants are those that go out of Uzbekistan to other countries and migrate out of the country. And I got confused in the paper on the, what data represents which one. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, there's a question that uh, like uh, more percent like a lower percent of migrants are in Tashkent or in other cities. Is it like it's it's uh, presented as a percent of all migrants in the data? But how does it look like if you take the number of migrants uh, as a percent of total families in Tashkent, like mm -hmm. percentages by region? Uh, like, or for example, uh, in the data we see like 25 percent of migrants are in like migrants that are in those Pakistan are in uh, urban areas, just 25%. So 75% are in rural areas. So the question raises here, uh, that's interesting case that could be uh, investigated more. Why are 75% in rural areas? Is it because uh, there is sampling issue or no? Uh, the, if the uh, like questionnaire, the survey has been uh, uh, random and represent the total population, then that's really interesting to see why uh, migrants go to the more rural areas. And uh, other questions that uh, I have for you is, uh, well, about the policy recommendations. So uh, we s nicely see that the expenses of, uh, like, one Uzbek migrant should earn more than two years of income to be able to afford a wedding in the home country. Uh, but the question is, uh, how do we, uh, well, how do we connect this? I mean, uh, how, how should we channel remittances? The policy recommendations uh, could come from the data. That's, that's the point that you, it, maybe there is data in the survey that asks migrants, uh, did you spend on uh, wedding like in the traditional expenses? Uh, did you spend on other traditional things? And uh, like policy recommendations such as uh, educating people on how to get loans, uh, I'm not sure how it relates to the survey or how it relates to the question that are making up or not. So there is a bunch of a lot of nice questions, nice data, uh, well presented and nice uh, policy recommendations. But the uh, I, I want to see a more coherent story, more that uh, would help a lot. And if uh, if data allows, there are uh, other interesting questions as suggestions for future work uh, that could be explored. Uh, what are the location of migrants that are out of Pakistan? Are they in Russia? Are they in uh, United States? How much are they sending? Uh, are remittances altruistic or self-interest? Altruistic means are they sending for families to use for consumption, or no, they're sending for investment. Then, among if you separate these two types of remittance senders, how much? how the spending pattern differs uh, among these families. So if I'm a migrant here, I'm sending home uh, some money, 
am I telling my family to invest for me, or is it just a need? So then uh, that could be explored. Gender of migrants, there are studies on that. Uh, female migrants uh, do more growth enhancing uh, spendings. That's uh, a recent study. Uh, about uh, the financial inclusion, getting a loan, that I, I think one way to connect it well to your uh, study is that if there is a question that uh, remittance recipient families, if you have information on uh, getting loans from banks to these families, if they got rejected, if they got, if they had access to loans, mm -hmm. if they borrowed from family, then uh, that would help a lot, to add substance to the uh, analysis. And also the labor force participation, that's an important matter of uh, uh, the issue of this are bliss, are remittance bliss going on. You can see if uh, labor force participation, is it lower among these families that are I think uh, the way you presented the data, it's already there. That you can see if maybe remittance recipients are participating more or no. Now that they receive more money, they become lazy and don't work. That's one answer you can answer. And for the future, if you get more panel data, then uh, definitely more interesting questions, such as are remittances uh, cyclical, procyclical, countercyclical? What are the impact of the recent <coughs> Russian uh, exchange rate depreciation on remittances? And these countries are a very interesting area uh, because they have, uh, you, they usually come from a high migrant concentration ratio. These countries have a lot of migrants in Russia and their business cycles and uh, economic situations uh, correlated with the uh, economic situations in Russia. And um, uh, I'll be interested to know about your future findings on uh, this, uh, expanding this study. Thank you.